sponsored by the Degama Group. Hello, welcome to Rumbo Minero. My name is Cesar Campos. And in this opportunity, together with our great producer, Miguel Zavala, we are going to be in charge of this program. How are you, Miguel? How are you, Cesar? Nice to be with you today. Miguel, a very busy week in political terms because the annual conference of executives was held. This meeting of top executives of large national companies in which once again in meetings of this nature, the need to reactivate the country's economy was discussed, relying on mining investments for which there are, according to the government, some important projects. And on the other hand, Peru has also received a, the pro tempore presidency of the organization of this Asia-Pacific Forum, APEC, in which we have a very significant presence and partners of the greatest importance, an event that we will also host for the third time in history next year, 2024. That's right, Cesar. Well, again, it highlights the importance of mining as an oxygen to get ahead in this uh, time of economic recession. Also, uh, the importance of having a mining project portfolio of more than $46 billion. And we will continue to insist on the program to move forward with a project, a project as important as Tia Maria, which is already ready and which would alleviate many things for our economy. And the government is not talking concretely about this. Despite the announcement that dialogues and conversations with the community environment have already been formalized. And even worse, Miguel, because there is a bill in the uh, Congress of the Republic called Territorial Planning, which not only the National Society of Mining, Oil and Energy, but also several actors of the national productive sector have objected to. Because what we need is to support territorial development. Territorial planning has traps where it empowers, for example, too much and above all, to increase the processing to obtain permits to regional governments and local governments. On this subject, we are going to talk with a great guest, Ivan Arenas, an expert in the political analysis of, these, of this subject. That's right, Cesar. And we also have the presence of Jimmy Flucker Pinilos, founder of Paltarumi, with whom we are going to discuss the subject of the of the promotion of, of the formalization of mining as a business model. Of course, and also with Jose Gonzalez, our international editor of Rumbo Minero magazine, we discussed Joe Biden's meeting with Xi Jinping, the leader of the People's Republic of China. This is about the APEC topic that we discussed at the beginning. We also want to thank in a very significant way the cordial invitation made to the entire team of Rumbo Minero and Peru Construye to the presell of Willax Television the signal through which you watch us every weekend. Truly, it was a pleasure to participate in this event in which the media power that Willex has achieved in such a short period of time is demonstrated and how it ranks among the public's preference, a preference that we also, of course, extend as gratitude to you who every Saturday and every Sunday also tune in either by Willex Television or PBO Radio to the broadcasting of Rumbo Minero and Peru Construi. Well, let's move on to the main mining news of the week by Gabriela Chico. Thank you, Jorge. These are the main mining news of the week. In a pioneering move in its field, Ferreros, a leader in machinery, implemented the robotization of its spare parts distribution center that supplies its national network of warehouses and directly to its customers. Thus, Ferrero streamlines by 40% the entry and extraction of the total of spare parts from its strategic center as part of more than $30 million of investment to add efficiencies in the value chain to its customers throughout the country. According to figures from the Mining Statistical Bulletin, in September 2003, the national copper production reported 235,178 fine metric tons, showing a growth of 2.5% compared to September of the previous year, 229,490 fine metric tons, as a result of higher production levels of Anglo-American Quilavico SA, plus 44.1%, Minera Las Bambas SA, plus 18.2%, and Marco Bresasi, plus 22.4%. As we had announced, we are once again pleased to present in Rumbo Minero Ivana Renas, an outstanding political analyst, communicator, and expert in all issues related to mining, to talk about this bill in the hands of the Constitutional Commission of the Congress, which determines a supposed territorial organization 
and which has been objected by important productive guilds of the country. Ivan, it is always a pleasure, I repeat, to receive you, you here in much. our program. Delighted. And I wanted to ask you from the outset, since you have analyzed the bill, as we have done, as have several associations, the National Mining Society, the National Society of Industries, and all of them are a concerned about the scope it could have and the new empowerments it also generates. What could this law generate if it is passed to increase the amount of paperwork in our country? What is your opinion? It, a very difficult time for the country, isn't it? The country basically needs certainties. And what this law brings is basically a new institutional framework, a new way of organizing the territory. When we understand that the state has always wanted to do that, but the state is the main source of informality, you see the municipalities that have cadastres, that have zonings, that have... But even so, municipalities are basically the first source of informality. To deliver the ordering, the articulation between the state, the creation of a system with different institutions, with different processes, with different inputs and different outputs, to deliver, to build, to organize that in a very serious institutional situation of institutional weakness in Peru is to deliver. Basically, it is to do one thing. It is to restrict some of the most important economic activities that this country has, as in the case, for example, of mining or some other sector. Ujum, eh, Ivan, eh, although eh, we are a mining program, this bill also affects eh, other industries as well. And I also wanted to ask you, why is it said that land reordering or land use planning is also political and not only technical? Look, this is important. The first question, in effect, is for all the economic sectors involved that it, it basically make use land use, right? The second thing is, if land use and land use planning is basically, it has some management tools the economic ecological zoning zone, we already said it, the cadaster. If it has some very important technical methodological tools, why should it be political? This is a very interesting thing because you open the politics, the decisions of a technical study of what should be something technical. You are going to, you open to that possibility that there are political debates and obviously ideological debates around that. In that case, in one way or another, there is some reluctance. For example, you know that the previous regional government, in this case, the last regional council of Ayacucho, already has an ordinance on issues of, for example, headwaters. Although there is still no exact methodology to define the methodology of headwaters. We all know that there are different exceptions to headwaters. There are different ways of understanding the headwaters. So if you hand over some important competences, such as, for example, restricting, strengthening the use of certain land to, in this case, regional governments or district governments, as I said, which are a fundamental source of informality, what you are doing is basically handing over to those authorities that basically have political objectives, a more important objective, which is the technical objective, and you are handing over the productive sectors, such as mining, for example, to their decision, right? And as has been demonstrated in recent history, even uh, regional governments and local governments that think according to their heads, more in their more very particular interests than in a dimension of articulating policies with the executive branch itself and with the regional governments themselves. We have almost 1,900 local governments, for example. We have 1,900 regional governments. The truth must be told, and this is part of the difficulty with which the structure of the state has been created. The spokesmen of this uh, bill say that nothing is going to happen, that nothing is going to happen, right? Actually, it is very difficult to believe them because, as I said, other forms of territorial planning have already been tried. All of them, absolutely all of them, restrict some economic activities. So I believe that here we should read very well what this project is about. Because look, one of the recitals of this project is based, for example, on the following, is based, for example, in which there are territorial conflicts over some natural resources. Where do they get that data from? That data is taken from the Ombudsman's office. You know that in Peru, there is no single methodology for the management 
mitigation, uh, reduction of social conflicts, they do not exist. There are different interpretations. There is the Ombudsman's Office, there is the PCM. What am I saying with all this? That this bill is based precisely on one of the methodologies of the Ombudsman's Office. But the Ombudsman's Office has many myopias with respect to understanding social conflicts. Because we all understand that social conflicts also have to have other views. They have, there are conflicts that are political, ideological, around especially mining. The fact that they say they are socio-environmental conflicts does not say much. In this case, relying on the, on the methodology of the, of the Ombudsman's office to be able to explain, to be able to propose a project like this, the truth is that it causes me, it causes me a lot of concern. Uh, Ivan, in your analysis and opinion, do you think there is an ideological logic to land use planning? Yes, completely. Because you see, they are looking at territorial planning as a, or the vision of the territory. It is an ideology already. Just as there is an ideology about natural resources and they have a result called post-extractivism, here they also have some ideology about some key concepts such as, for example, the issue of land use planning and especially about territory. Uh, what they propose is a rigid territory, when territory is something uh, flexible, adaptive, even to technological innovations, in such a way that you cannot say, here you have to do only mining, here you have to do only agriculture. Secondly, this concept completely ignores something important, which is the collaboration between mining and agriculture. This is something that is not said much. Furthermore, mining not only collaborates with agriculture, it collaborates with livestock, even with tourism projects, and I will not even mention educational or social projects. So there is an ideology around, there are ideas around concepts such as, for example, this issue of territorial concepts, which, as I said, they see as something rigid when it should be something absolutely flexible that adapts to technological innovations. And that is what they are not seeing in this case. We have witnessed, at least in my case, to see how effectively after the mine closure programs are applied, there is immediate collaboration with the livestock and agricultural environment. Even crops are strengthened with much more developed fertilizers. The community is incorporated again so that they can participate in all the benefits that they have already obtained, a benefit to the extent that it was directly provided by the mining companies. And regarding the mining companies, eh, for some time now, an alternative concept has been developed which is called territorial development. In the last Perumin, in which you were also present, Ivan, uh, there was a chapter of discussion that I found fascinating because territorial development implies, first of all, including different zones, as you say, due to the flexibility of exploitation areas that may exist, be it hydrocarbons, agricultural, or mining, or also fishing extraction. Uh, yes, of fishing. course, the methodology of territorial development it's a methodology that proposes to strengthen some of the potentialities that the territory may have. And that obviously different stakeholders may be involved, including companies and communities. And that it promotes integration. That's exactly, what I wanted to exactly. go to, isn't it? Because no, you don't look at the division that there may be for being possessors or owners of a certain territory. Everything is integrated. Exactly. What they are proposing, in this case the government, is basically under the argument of articulating, ordering, organizing the territory, it is doing absolutely the opposite. What it is going to generate is such a disorder that it will be impossible for some eh, 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 projects or some investments, especially in extractive matters, to be possible. That is the detail. Imagine you building a system with more than 14 institutions in this country. So far, they cannot constitute a one-stop shop. And I am telling you in general, the whole state a single window for mining. Imagine building a system. And not only that, the advocates, the promoters of this bill say something else that is fundamental. When asked who is going to be in charge of it, they say the PCM. And the PCM, they say, in addition to that, must be strong, must be politically legitimate. I can imagine the PCM working that kind of thing when it cannot even consolidate a way of understanding social conflicts. There is no single methodology to understand social conflicts. They cannot agree with the state and you are going to constitute a system as big as this one? Uh, the truth is very clear, Ivan. I just wanted to end by pointing out that 
Indeed, this seems contradictory to what Premier Alberto Otarola came to offer at the last meeting of the annual conference of executives, which I do not doubt his good intention of wanting to a implement and make all the economic development in the future of the country rest on mining investments. But norms of this nature contradict. It sounds this. nice. That is the word sounds very nice. Territorial organization. We have to organize the territory. Very well, we must organize the territory. But what is the purpose of land use planning? For example, if you want to organize the territory to avoid the negative impacts, for example, of the El Nino phenomenon, you can do it for that. But be careful, municipalities already do it. But if you want to order the territory, for example, to, as they say, A, reduce the pressure on natural resources. But look who generates pressure on natural resources. It is the illegal economy and the informal economy as well. For example, that is, we cannot deny that. So we have to detect very well what is the diagnosis of what is really happening, to rely only on this. To trust, to build a law relying on a data that is not necessarily real, gives AA proposals like these that undoubtedly could restrict a lot, especially the mining activity, which is important for the country. Very clear, Ivan. Thank you very much. And as always, we will have you in the next opportunity to see, hopefully in the Congress, the brains of our parliamentary representatives will be enlightened in order to leave uh, practically annulled the initiative because it will not bring anything good to the development of the country and even less when we are talking about the need to activate all the economic operators in our uh, country. Thank you very much. Ivan Arenas, a political analyst, communicator and expert in mining issues, was with us. We are taking a pause, but first inviting Gabi Chicoma, Gabriela Chicoma, to explain to us what is going to happen with Expomina 2024. Thank you very much. Expomina Peru, the largest and most important mining event of the 2024, with 16 years of trajectory, with the special participation of the United States as guest mining country. Expomina Peru is the only Peruvian event certified by the United States Department of Commerce. Do not be left out and be part of this great mining event. Reserve your booth at Expomina Peru. For more information, visit our website, doexpominaperu.com. Well, in our Rumbo Minero blog, American Mining, we have, as always, the pleasure of linking up from Wall Street, New York, with Jose Gonzalez, international editor of our magazine Rumbo Minero, and a very sharp analyst of what is happening in the world. How are you, dear Jose? Welcome, as always. Very well, Cesar. Delighted. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Uh, it is inevitable to mention that this week, uh, well, the APEC meeting took place in which Peru and President Dina Boluarte received the pro tempore presidency of this important Asia-Pacific Forum, which uh, we have been part of for more than 20 years, and that Peru has hosted the meeting on two occasions, and the next third one will be in the year 2024. On the other hand, there was also the expected meeting between Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden, so that apparently between quotation marks, a to smooth out differences, and to look together at the future of a much more effective cooperation. How do you see the conclusion of what has been reached after this forum? That's right, Caesar. As you rightly mentioned, APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, founded in 1989 under an Australian initiative, is a meeting place where the leaders of 21 Pacific Rim countries, including Peru, which joined in 1998, meet to discuss economic policies and announce agreements and initiatives. This year in San Francisco, the focus has been on what has been a further step towards detente between the United States and China, making progress on joint efforts linked to opiate trafficking and the reopening of military to military communications between the two countries in a meeting that was highly choreographed. The two presidents summit is also the culmination of ministerial outreach that included visits to China by the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of State, the Special Envoy for the Environment and the Secretary of Commerce with their Chinese counterparts. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, for his part, has downplayed speculation about a U.S.-China disengagement, underscoring President Biden's position, which proposes de-risking the relationship by focusing on competition, not conflict. China, for its part, has recently adopted a softer tone toward the United States after years of aggressive rhetoric, promising to protect foreign investors. 
In an unusual gesture for the Chinese president, Xi Jinping hosted a dinner for a score of American businessmen and has met with his friends from Iowa, a group of farmers he met in Muscatine as part of an agricultural delegation to China in 1985. Such gestures have, as you point out, caused American analysts to stress that the United States and China have entered a period of detente in the rivalry in what has been called the Second Cold War, declared by the tariff war unleashed during Donald Trump's presidency, which was exacerbated by COVID and accusations of an intentional origin of the virus in China. The detente is a product of political circumstances. Biden has already begun his campaign for the 2024 presidential election, and she faces an economy that has lost the vitality of the past, and the conflicts in Ukraine and Israel contribute, not contribute to the well-being of either of the two global economic hegemons. The detente is favorable to mining to the extent that it reduces geopolitical risk, favoring better economic dynamics that are positive for conditions, metal and mineral prices, promoting competition between China and the West for critical minerals without conflicts that affect production. As you point out, the circumstances are favorable for Peru insofar as the country assumes the pro-temporary presidency after an eventful transfer here from Mexico. It is expected that the forum will be held in Peru next year and that this China-U.S. detente will perhaps lead to both presidents visiting our country next year, highlighting the importance of the meeting. Correct, Jose. On the other hand, and within the framework of the dynamics of global growth and its effect on the prices of minerals and metals, this week that has just ended began with Moody's downgrading the outlook of the U.S. debt rating from stable to negative due to the country's fiscal deficit and the political polarization at a time when the government shutdown is being discussed again, E due to the lack of budget approval in the legislature. E tell us, how do such events impact global growth and mining? Uh, that's right, Miguel. Uh, and Moody's downgraded the U.S. debt outlook from stable to negative, maintaining the AAA rating, pointing to the growing risk facing the country's fiscal strength, in a week in which the government was again about to shut down due to lack of political agreements in Congress, which prevent passing a budget that allows maintaining public services in office. According to the rating agency, the downgrade is due to the fact that in a context of high interest rates, without effective fiscal policy measures to reduce public spending or increase tax revenues, Moody's expects the U.S. fiscal deficit to remain very large, significantly weakening the affordability of debt due to the financial costs involved. Moody's adds that the continued polarization of Congress increases the risk that successive administrations, i.e. not only this one but those to come, will fail to reach consensus on a fiscal plan that would slow the decline in debt affordability. Moody's, however, maintains that the United States retains its exceptional economic strength, which is why it has not changed the country's debt rating. In August of this year, Fitch cut the U.S. debt rating from AAA to AA+, pointing to fiscal deterioration over the next three years amid eroding governance and the rising cost of debt. Although the financial markets were unmoved by Moody's announcement, it is obvious, Miguel, that fiscal conditions and their political origins in the context of higher interest rates for a longer period of time threaten U.S. economic growth, which the IMF projects at 2.1% this year and 1.5% for 2023. With the moderate growth in China, the prices of minerals and metals will continue to remain depressed for the next few months despite the fact that the structural conditions indicate that prices will increase in the coming years. Jose, thank you very much for all this analysis that you have done for us on two very important and transcendental topics. We will link up A next week. I would be delighted. Thank you. Jose Gonzalez, international editor of the magazine Rumbo Minero, which I have here in my hands. All the interesting comments and deep analysis made by Jose Gonzalez. You can also see it in our magazine physically, or you can also download through www.rumbominero.com uh, the same.
Just access it absolutely, A, free of charge. That's right, say so. It is time to pass to the block of the Peruvian Institute of Mining Engineers. The International Congress of Prospectors and Explorers, ProExplo, is the second most important mining event in the country and the most relevant in terms of exploration and geology in Latin America. The importance of exploration lies in the fundamental role it plays in the discovery and establishment of new mining projects. For this reason, Piero Explo is a mandatory meeting for companies and professionals working in the sector. In its most recent edition, more than 3,000 people participated physically and virtually, and it is expected that its 14th edition will be held in 2025 under the leadership of its president, Walter Tejada. We look forward to seeing you at Pro Explo 2025. At the international level, the Peruvian Institute of Mining Engineers has continued its role of disseminating the country's mining potential in various international forums, such as the Society for Mining, Metallurgy and Exploration, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, and the World Mining Congress. In addition, since 2019 we were incorporated as members of the International Council on Mining and Metals and hosted the 100th meeting of the International Organizing Committee of the World Mining Congress. We are currently preparing to host the 27th edition of the World Mining Congress, which will be held in our country in 2026. Perumin is the leading mining convention in Latin America and the world, bringing together the most prominent leaders in the global mining sector. Government representatives, investors, researchers, and many professionals linked to this industry. For 70 years, our institute has been organizing this great event, where the challenges and opportunities of mining are analyzed. In its last edition, Perumin 36, gathered more than 65,000 visitors from 56 countries and 23 regions of Peru, which turned Arequipa into the world's mining capital. The next edition of the Mining Convention will be chaired by Jimena Sologuren. We look forward to seeing you at Perumin 37. Well, I would like to welcome now Jimmy Fluker. He is Fluker Pinillos, the founder of Paltarumi. We are going to talk about the impulse to mining formalization as a business model. Jimmy, how are you? Welcome to Rumbo Minero. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'll try to be the best I can. As clear as possible. Te comento. Y... For everything I've been seeing and living in all these years, here in Peru there is a potential, a huge potential. Great, you know, if it is exploiting in the right way, the reason is that there is no constant support from the state. So that all this is done in a totally organized way. And they are not criminalizing artisanal mining, small scale mining, the entrepreneur who today has left the cities since there has already been a recession here in Peru. And they have been realizing that the alternative is mining. And Peru is mining, Peru is mining, and Peru is mining. With mining in Peru running with a locomotive, there should be no anemia, there should be no poor. Now you refer to the, to the, to the, to the artisanal group. I would like so that our viewers can understand a little bit, you who are a specialist in the subject. How would you define the groups? Because that is the question that everybody asks, isn't it? The artisans, the informal ones, who also want to formalize and those who do not want to formalize. How, 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 how as do you define is, them? As it is. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to make a small parenthesis. I was recently uh, at the London e Metal Exchange and specialists, environmentalists, came out to speak. Uh, uh, and they see uh, 
that the mining issue in the world is changing. Again, we are going to go back to small mining with higher grades, less environmental impact, more labor, right? And that is the one we really criminalize in Peru today. Because they are not being given the support of knowledge, the state. The tax authorities should be with the miners to explain how to pay taxes, how to fill out their guides, how to fill out to help them formalize as quickly as possible what Peru needs more than anything else are numbers, taxes, and collection. Instead of there being an iron fist from the state and saying, you eh, help the miner to understand what pollution is, how to obtain his documents, you, Sunat, you are going to support him so that the miner can pay taxes, buy his house, his cars, and not be persecuted. Because Unfortunately, there is a lot of ignorance, is there not, in this sector. So, what you have to achieve here is consensus and truces, permanent truces, in the short term, so that the miner does not stop extracting, because it is in the state's interest to pay this tax. It is a big business in which the state is not participating, it is true in some cases? In many cases, right? So. That is where Bolivia benefits, other countries benefit, they benefit, they extract metals and minerals, supported also with, 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 with people from in uniform, so to speak, right? Because it is a business, as I keep saying, there is a lot of good police, because otherwise we would not be talking here, and Pedro Castillo would still be president, right? I didn't come here to talk about politics, but globally speaking, we are already seeing a change in the, in the reduction of the tonnage produced by our quality. Okay, we are, going to, we are going to interrupt you for a little while because we have to ask questions in order to, uh, more shorter, in order to uh, cover all the questions. Cesar, please. Yes, very specifically, Jimmy. Last year, the National Policy for Small Mining and Informal Mining was approved, a, a artisanal, better said, and a, there is talk that the Ministry of Energy and Mines is already preparing a law initiative in this respect. Do you know it? Do you have a knowledge of its scope? Have you worked with the sector you represent? Let me tell you. We do not only, uh, we collect and process from third parties with an implacable traceability. I come from living abroad for many years. I have the first world in my head. We have built a plan uh, always at the base, thinking about in large mining and medium mining with all those protocols ye 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 and rules that they ask for because we have seen it in the future to what you ask e the formalization process was born crooked it was born e in a lame e way since in my case, I am going to formalize those who are in my minds if I am going to formalize them. But not necessarily all the miners, small, medium, or large-scale miners who have concessions are going to accept a contract with the miner who is in the process of formalization. Because the only thing that is missing for the miner to finish and have his diploma is that the owner of the concession signs an exploitation contract. That is the only thing that is missing. That is why in 99% of the cases this has not happened. We, in the mind that we have, we are willing to work with the miners that are already there, as long as they comply with the environment, 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 and with all the rules, e if it is going to be artisanal mining, artisanal mining, 
And if it is going to be small mining with the rules of the small mining ministry, isn't it? Agreed. <laughs> Jimmy, we are running out of time. What investment projects do you have planned for the year 2024? I would like you to mention them. We have 10 open fronts, which we are always pushing to have our own projects. And let this be very clear, that most of the small, medium, and large mining collects ore from artisans and miners in the process of formalization. This is very important. Peru is a mining country. And someday we will sit down to talk more. Peru is a mining country and can work hand in hand with agriculture and energy, which are the bases to move this country forward. Okay, Jimmy, thank you very much for coming to Rumbo Minero. E time is short, but we are going to have other interviews so we can go a little deeper. Este, Gabby, go ahead con e the Expomina announcement. Thank you very much. Expomina Peru from September 11th to 13th, 2024, will be chaired by Luis Rivera, Executive Vice President of Goldfields Las Americas, and integrated by an advisory board of recognized mining leaders who will support us to achieve a magnificent organization. Highlight your brand through the different sponsorships we offer at Expomina Peru. Networking opportunities, participation in exclusive activities, promotion in the media, among other important benefits. For more information, visit our website, www.expomenapieru.com. We end here, Rumbo A. Minero Miguel. Uh, by highlighting the very interesting position, position and vision of Ivan Arenas, expert in mining matters, communicator, political analyst on this bill. As he himself says, it is very nice, is it not, to call it territorial planning to win the ear of certain authorities, but however, it is going to bring many problems for that economic development that rests on industries such as hydrocarbons, mining, fishing, which have stood up to protest against the unnecessary scope and empowerment given to local and regional governments, eh, which increase the, eh, the procedures to obtain permits. Always clear and precise, Ivan Arenas, in his opinions. As you say, the name sounds nice, but in the end it is not, and it could bring a lot of damage to mining and above all to move forward the projects that we have in our portfolio. It also makes us think that the government is doing something else with one hand, one thing, and with the other hand, it does very different things, does it not? So unfortunately, we have to continue to deal with this a lack of a suitable work on the part of the government. And let us hope that the congressmen are enlightened and do not move this project forward. Yes, at least it is still in the Constitution Committee, and there is still a very broad debate which we obviously encourage with the greatest possible clarity and transparency so that you, my friend, viewer, friend, friend, listener, friend, can understand that this conspires against your own development, the development of your children. Whatever sounds nice, always be suspicious. They do not always bring us things that are very good for the future of the country. I am Cesar Campos, together with Miguel Zavala. We have been conducting this space of Rumbo Minero. Do not move because Peru Construye is coming.